Fünf Tag. A very warm good evening, everyone. Myself, Shudashi Mishra, session anchor for today's webinar. A warm welcome to you all on the forty-first webinar of Botanical Society of Goa, in association with Agricos Alumni Association, Goa. The topic for today's webinar is importance of pollinating agents, raising seedlings of winter veggies, and companion planting. We have with us our session moderator for the webinar, Sir Miguel Braganza. Agricultural Consultant and Visiting Professor of Urban Gardening at Dempey College of Arts and Science, Goa. Welcome, sir. We have three speakers with us today: Miss Simeon Fernandez, Mr. Aaron Andrad, and Mr. Akshay Parab. A warm welcome to you all. I would like to begin the session with Albert Einstein's quote on pollinating organisms. He says, "If bees disappeared off the earth face." man would have four years left to live this explains the importance of pollinating agents for our existence to enlighten us further on importance of animals birds and insects on pollination we have our first speaker ms simeon fernandez simeon has completed her bsc biotechnology degree at dempey college of arts and science goa Currently, she is pursuing her master's in biotechnology at Saint Xavier College, Mumbai. She is the topper of biotechnology at Goa University exams. She has chose this area as her career because of her interest in science and research. Besides this, she is a singer with melodious voice and loves playing guitar. She is keen about gardening and plants too. Without further ado, I request Miss Simeon Fernandez to start with her presentation. Thank you, Sir Takshi. Am I audible? You are. Yes. Uh, Lisa, can you please uh, present my presentation? Yeah, Simeon. Just give me a while. I'll present it. Thank you. A very good evening to everyone. Today, I will be talking about uh, the importance of animals, birds, and insects in pollination. Next slide, please. So, the first question that comes to mind is, what is pollination? Scientifically speaking, pollination refers to the transfer of pollen grains. from the anther of one flower to the stigma of another flower or the same flower in order that the pollen will reach the ovule and fertilization will occur and this then leads to the formation of seeds now seeds are what will give you a new plant it will help in the production of a new generation and it will it is what keeps the species going flowers are basically just tools that are used by the plant for making the seed um basically there are two types of pollination that is self pollination and cross pollination in self pollination the pollen is transferred from the anther to the stigma of the same flower when we talk about cross pollination it involves the transfer of pollen grains from one flower to the stigma of another flower next slide please now bearing all of this in mind uh the next question that comes is what or how does the pollen travel so there are a lot of factors that cause this pollen to travel uh wind and water plays a very important role in pollination but what i will be specifically talking about is how animals plants and insects help in carrying out pollination and i cannot or won't be able to stress on how important these Uh, species are without first understanding the role that they play and how they carry out pollination when we think of pollinators uh, the first thing that usually comes to our mind may be honey bees and butterflies and maybe to some extent birds but the array of pollinators is really unending and they you know they 
it moves from really tiny flies and gnats and midges to even mammals like bats and lemurs and reptiles like geckos and lizards. Next slide, please. So why do these pollinators visit flowers? Now, over the years, these plants and pollinators have co-evolved. It means that they have evolved together. The plants realize and they know that they need, they rely on these pollinators in order to keep their species going. So they have evolved and they have come up with certain, uh, you know, factors that attract these pollinators. Now, nectar and pollen are sources of food that the plants and the flowers provide for these pollinators. Pollen is a very rich source of protein and nectar is a sugar source. Apart from that, parts of flowers will also act as food for pollinators. Now, not all pollinators will, you know, feed on the flowers. Only a few uh, like beetles that have really strong mandibles and can chew to these flower parts do feed on them. The third point is shelter or nursery pollination. Now, this is a very unique relationship that occurs wherein the plant or the flower will provide a home to the eggs of uh, maybe a wasp or maybe a moth. So these moths or wasps will lay their eggs in the flower ovary and in turn, the moth or the wasp will carry out pollination. The fourth is nest building material. This is more specifically uh, correct for maybe birds that, uh, you know, build nests in search of other pollinators. Now, this might be a, a, a bit confounding in search of other pollinators, but there have been documented carnivorous pollinators. Now, pollination in this case um, is a really um, not a direct outcome. It is rather um, a consequence of these carnivorous pollinators foraging around these plants for other pollinators, other smaller pollinators, like maybe lizards or flies. So as they move around these plants, the pollen gets stuck onto their body and it gets transferred from flower to flower. Another situation is pollination syndrome. This is a rather unique uh, phenomenon, I would say, wherein uh, flowers, they attract pollinators by using a combination of shape, scent and color. For example, some plants will use mimicry to deceive or fool animals into visiting the flowers without having to provide a reward. Now, this is, of, this is called pollination syndrome. So they do this in the form of food deception, wherein the flowers will be really brightly colored or it will have a really nice uh, perfume, but there is no actual nectar that is provided to the uh, insect or the animal. In sexual deception, what happens is that there are compounds that, that are released by the flowers that smell like pheromones um, that are pheromones that are given out by the female counterpart of the particular insect. Or maybe the flower will look like the female counterpart of that particular insect. And so the male, uh, male of that species are attracted <laughs> towards these flowers and, you know, they uh, visit the flowers. And as they move from flower to flower, the pollen that is stuck on your body will move from one flower to another. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first example that I would give is uh, honeybees because they are the most common and the most widely known pollinator. They are champion pollinators and rightly called so because they carry out pollination of so many, uh, not just, uh, you know, flowers, but also a lot of horticultural crops. Horticultural crops like cabbages, cauliflowers, coriander, uh, cucumber, all cucurbits are pollinated by honeybees. Flowers like cup and saucer, roses, hydrangea, dandelions. So both the plant and the bees will benefit from each other. So the bees get nectar and pollen and the plants get pollen transferred. Um, so bees usually visit flowers that are, you know, brightly colored and they have a fresh, mild and pleasant odor. The flower shape should be um, open and it should have a landing platform so that the bees can, you know, sit onto the flower. Next slide, please. In India, we have four native honeybees that are documented. Uh, that is the Apis dorsata, the Apis serena indica, Apis floria, and the stingless honeybee that is known as 
also known as trigona. Next slide, please. Birds. Um, so the process of pollination carried out by birds is known as ornithophily. Flowers that are visited by birds are usually tubular or cup-shaped or funnel-shaped. Now, this is because um, the birds, they have beaks, and so it is easy for them to reach into the flower, into these uh, cup-shaped flowers, to reach the nectar. Um, also, they are attracted to flowers that are usually brightly colored and will have a perching place for them to uh, sit and uh, get to the nectar. Uh, examples of flowers that are pollinated by birds are hibiscus, orchid, and cactus flowers. And birds that uh, are help in pollination are locally found birds uh, like bulbuls and parakeets, jungle miners and uh, jungle babbler, sunbirds, etc. Next slide, please. Butterflies and moths. Uh, so butterflies, they are actually less efficient than bees if you go to see in carrying out pollination, but they do carry out pollination and that's what matters. So um, why do I say that they're less efficient is because uh, they have really long and slender legs. So when they perch onto the flowers, their body doesn't really touch the pollen and uh, by chance factor, if they do pick up pollen, it gets stuck onto their body. And as they fly from flower to flower, the pollen gets transferred. They mostly flavor, favor flat and clustered flowers that provide landing platforms. And also these flowers need to be brightly colored. So examples of flowers that are pollinated by butterflies are milkweed, butterfly bush, exora. Next slide, please. Moths. Now, moths are usually active during late evening or at night. So they visit flowers that are open during that time. What happens is that the yucca moth will lay its eggs in the yucca plant flowers. And in turn, it will deliberately make a ball out of the pollen and stuff it into the stigma of the flowers so that it makes sure that pollination is done, is carried out, and the seeds will definitely form. Now it does this uh, because its larvae will feed on the seeds of the of the yucca plant flowers. Now the question that arises is, uh, if this is the case, if the larvae will feed on the seeds, then what is the point? But they don't really feed on all of the seeds and some of the seeds do survive. And those that survive will, you know, form the next generation. Next slide, please. That. Now the process of pollination carried out by bats is known as chiracterophily. And they are really important pollinators in tropical and desert places. They visit flowers that are large and white and have a really fermented or musky odor. They, not all bats uh, have evolved to carry out pollination. There are a specific group of bats that are known as nectar bats or fruit bats that carry out pollination. They help to pollinate over 300 species of fruit trees and over 500 species of plant altogether. Now, they really love nectar. So when they uh, stuff their faces into the flowers in order to reach the nectar, now these bats, they have specialized long tongues to reach the nectar. So when they do this, the pollen gets stuck onto their face. And when they move from one flower to another in search of uh, nectar and pollen, uh, the pollen also gets transferred from one flower to another. Um, they pollinate flowers and uh, fruit trees like mango, banana, guava, and also agave, which is a, a very economically important plant because it is, uh, agave flowers are used to prepare tequila. And the baobab tree, which is really famous in Africa and Australia, uh, rely solely on bats for pollination. Next slide, please. In India, the well-documented species of nectar-feeding bats are the cave nectar bat and the long-tongued fruit bat. Next slide, please. Yeah. Beetles, flies, and ants. Beetles were actually the first insect that evolved to aid in pollination. And they're often known as the mess and soil pollinators. 
and rye cake also because they will eat and defecate their way through the flowers. And hence, a lot of the flowers that beetles visit have evolved to, you know, have tough petals and leaves so that these beetles can't easily eat their way through them. Examples of beetles that feed on, I mean, that carry our pollination are uh, scarabs, soldier beetles, longhorn beetles, sap beetles. And they carry out pollination of pond lilies, tulips, and sunflowers. Ants, ants are social insects and they really love nectar. Since they do not have wings, they will crawl into flowers and they usually visit low growing flowers, which are close to the stem. And as they crawl and move from one flower to another, the pollen that is stuck to their body will uh, also travel along with them and move from one flower to another. Um, next slide, please. Now, flies. When we think about flies, we think like we think that they're really annoying creatures because they are, but they also have a lot of use. And to me itself, it was very interesting when I read about them and how important they are in pollination. So um, flies, um, they help to pollinate more than 100 types of crops. So mostly they visit uh, flowers that have a really bad odor or a really putrid odor. Uh, flies are the primary pollinators for cocoa trees. So thanks to them, we have chocolate. Uh, even mosquitoes carry out pollination, mostly of orchids. And uh, carrion flowers is another example of flowers that are pollinated by flies. These carrion flowers are a group of flowers that are commonly known as corpse flowers. So they really have, uh, they emit a really foul odor and they also look like rotting flesh. So this attracts scavenging flies as pollinators. Next slide, please. Other unusual pollinators are reptiles like geckos and skinks and lemurs. They are amongst, they're one of the largest known pollinators. They're mammals and they're known pollinators of the traveler's farm in Madagascar. Uh, as you can see, they're really furry. And so they, when they feed onto these flowers, the pollen will get stuck onto their fur or, and it also on their faces. And when they move from one flower to another, the pollen will travel from one flower to another. Another example is the sweet toothed sengai in Australia. They are really small mammals, really small creatures, but they love nectar. And they extract nectar from the flowers of the pagoda lily plant and with their long slender tongues. But they are really small and efficient in carrying out pollination of these species of flowers. Next slide, please. Now, why is pollination and pollinators, why are they so important? So much of the food that we eat, one out of every three bites of food that we eat depends on pollinators. Um, almost 80 to 87 percent of all flowering plants and over three fourths of uh, crop plants, they rely on pollination. Half of the world's fibers, oils and raw materials, they're produced because of pollination that is carried out by these pollinators. Of course, you can carry out pollination by hands, but that is not really efficient. And also, it will lead to a decrease in the quality of the yield because uh, it does not generate um, a lot of diversity. Also, um, pollination is an essential ecological function. Now, if pollinators do not survive, and a lot of them are on, you know, steadily declining, the plants that rely on them that is especially in a specialist relationship will not survive. Also, a lot of wild wild plants and wild flowers are also pollinated by these animals. They won't survive either. And so this will lead to a collapse of the Earth's ecosystems as we know them. And also agriculture, the agricultural sector will suffer if pollinators uh, decrease in number. Because as I've already mentioned, and said that a lot of horticultural crops depend on pollinators. And if they disappear, we won't have any food to eat. There are also so many benefits of pollination. 
It helps to increase the yield in terms of fruit yield as well as seed yield. It improves the quality of our food because it increases genetic diversity. It helps in the production of clean air because ultimately pollinators will help in reproduction of wild plants. The more the number of wild plants, the more the, more the amount of oxygen. Cultural importance. Now, um, a lot of these plants, local plants and wild plants, they have a lot of medicinal uses, religious uses. And so pollinators do play a role in, you know, producing health production of these, reproduction of these plants. But sadly, the status of our pollinators is declining. Now, mostly, uh, I would say this is because of human activity, loss of habitat, nesting and feeding, climate change, human activity induced climate change. Humans have altered natural landscape and changed land use. Environmental pollution leads to a decrease in the diversity in the abundance as well as the health deteriorates the health of these pollinators. Breeding of non-native forms of bees leads to diseases. Now, in the year 1983, the species of Apis mellifera was introduced in India. It is a European uh, species of honeybee. It does. It was introduced because it has a very high honey yield. But it started slowly replacing the native bees. And what happens is that these uh, Apis mellifera, they carry a lot of pathogens with them. And this could lead. I mean, it leads to the you know spread of diseases among our native species. And if we continue to breed like this um, foreign breed, what about our native breeds? They will inevitably decline in number and it will lead to the regional extinction of native species. Also, another uh, issue is the use of insecticides and pesticides. Now, I understand the use of insecticides and pesticides to control pests and insects that feed on crops. But inevitably, and you know, it, the consequence is that it leads to the, it kills uh, good insects as well. So this also has led to the decrease in the number of pollinators. How, next slide please. So how can we help our pollinators? So the first thing I would say is to say no to a monotonous grass lawn. I don't really understand the idea behind it. It's just a grass lawn. It, it doesn't even look nice. Personally, that's what I think. It would really be nice if uh, we would start to grow, if you can. Um, a lot of, you know, introduce diversity into your garden. Grow a variety of plants, especially local plants like uh, aboli and ganyori and mogri, mogre. Um, Pizzalpinia, Balsam, Chidde. This will help our uh, native pollinators to increase. That's what we need. They know our, you know, they know our surrounding. They have been here for so many years. They know how everything works. They know how the ecosystem works. So that is what will help them grow. Um, try stopping or at least limit the use of insecticides and pesticides. Um, next. Let the caterpillars be. Now, a lot of these caterpillars, uh, they, I mean, butterflies and moth caterpillars, they appear all of a sudden on our plants and they will eat, eat their way through the leaves. And that is the only source of food they have. And if, if you kill them, um, we'll have no butterflies and no moths. I mean, it, I mean, yeah, it, it really, you know, sometimes it looks really ugly when they eat their way through the leaves. But if it's really bothering you, what you could do is maybe grow two of the same kinds of plants and plant the second plant in such an area that uh, that you can't see. So, uh, you know, the caterpillars and the, uh, do have something to feed on. Also, you could try beekeeping, which I believe is a really upcoming trend right now. And uh, these two pictures that I have obtained are from Mr. Melvin D'Souza. And uh, he's a, he does make, have beekeeping workshops, so you can always contact him. And if you're doing, if you're trying beekeeping, please make sure that you use native species. 
support the conservation of our forests and agricultural lands. That is what is of the utmost importance. And lastly, spread the word. Because the more number of people that know about this, the better it is. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Simeon. It was great to know a lot about pollination. Next, we have with us Mr. Aaron Andrad. He would be presenting on the topic, Raising Seedlings in Winter Crops. Mr. Aaron has completed his BSc in Agriculture from Don Bosco College of Agriculture, Goa. His dream, dedication, and curiosity about plants and livestock have led him to pursue this field as his career. He has worked in Sociodad Patriotica Farm at Ungame. Currently, he is pursuing stockman training course at STC Kurti Ponda to achieve his dream of becoming a veterinarian. Welcome, Mr. Andrin, uh, welcome, Mr. Aaron, and you may begin with the presentation. Good evening, everyone. And today I'll be presenting. Can you hear me? A little louder, Aaron. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Next slide. Next slide, please. Can you hear me? Okay. It's louder. It's still a little bit soft. We can't hear you. You can hear me now. Hello. Yeah, we can hear you, but can you make it louder? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, today I'll be presenting like uh, raising seed, uh, seedlings of winter vegetables and I'll be explaining like Lisa, can I can this slide? Next slide, please. All right, so uh, due to technical issues, let's move on to our next presentation now. Uh, we know that there are different tricks which can make our field full of green gold. And to know about this, we have our next speaker, Mr. Akshay Parap, who will be presenting on the topic, intercropping and companion planting in fields and orchard. Mr. Akshay is presently pursuing masters in agricultural horticulture with fruit science as his specialization at lovely professional university, Punjab. He has completed his BSc in agriculture at Don Bosco College of Agriculture, Goa. He is a bright student since childhood and a topper of the college. He has received Krishithan National Award in Agriculture in 2017 from Konkan region. He has also worked as an agricultural instructor at a school in North Goa. Western, uh, welcome Mr. Akshay and you may begin with the session. So, am I audible? It's clear, Akshay. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Yes. Uh, today, I will discuss uh, this topic on companion planting. Go to the next slide. Okay, so basically companion planting is art of putting plants that get along next to each other and those that don't away from the each other. In scientific word, we can see we can say that planting of different crops in close proximity for a number of different reasons. Companion planting can be applied in both time and space. So basically, plants that don't get along should neither be planted next to each other at the same time nor following each other in the crop rotation. The benefits from plants that do get along 
can be reaped by not just planting them together in the same bed, but also by having them in adjacent beds or by following one with other crop in the crop rotation. Next slide. Okay, so why we are doing this companion planting? So it is easy for farmers to go for a single crop or for monoculture in a uh, given plot, but the benefits of companion planting easily outweighs the potential inconvenience caused by the monocultures. Some of the benefits include increased biosat diversity in the plot, pest control, weed reduction, maximization of space and pollination. There are also other uh, benefits of companion planting. We will see this one by one. So next slide. So companion planting and organic agriculture. Actually, if we go to see this uh, organic agriculture and companion planting go hand in hand. The monoculture often presents widespread pest and disease problems. Uh, and with no pesticide and herbicides at disposal, companion planting is an easy way to help solve pest and uh, weed problems. As we can see here in this uh, figure, there are different components of organic farming shown here. So companion planting is basically used in almost three of these in green leaf manuring, crop rotation and biological management. Go to the next slide. So for example, we can see uh, here, if a pest is mainly attracted to cucumbers and a farmer is planting only cucumbers in the crop, it becomes very easy for the pest to attack on the cucumber plants. So the conventional farmer, what he will do here is, is he will go for the pesticides or other chemicals. But for organic farmers, he has no other option but to create great diversity in the farm. It becomes easier to maintain a single crop, but uh, by adding multiple other crops to the mix, they can easily uh, decrease the instance of pest and disease problems in the uh, crop or the plot. Next slide. So now we will see uh, benefits of component planting one by one. First one is uh, increased biodiversity. As we have seen in the previous example, component planting adds a variety of plants to the garden, thereby increasing the biodiversity, uh, which is uh, helpful both aesthetically and uh, also to repel pest and diseases. And component planting uh, won't solve the pest problems uh, totally, but it is an integral part of minimizing the impact of pest damage. Uh, and the secondly, uh, when we are going for component planting, there is at least insurance. If suppose one crop is failing, then uh, we are having the other crop to harvest. So it uh, acts like uh, insurance uh, policy in the field. Uh, next slide. So component planting also helps in saving space. Uh, for example, if uh, there are many crops which are of uh, short season, so when we are planting short season crops in the same bed and later when they are maturing, we can plant the long season crops or the crops which are takes longer duration for uh, harvesting. For example, we can see we can grow spinach or amaranth in the beds uh, when the other crops like tomatoes and brinjal are generally in the nursery stage. And so when uh, by the time tomatoes or brinjal will come to the transplanting stage in the main field by the time the spinach or amaranth can be harvested. In this way, we can save space and uh, we can get yield from both the crops. Then also climbers such as beans or cucumbers can be sown in the corn field. So these beans or cucumbers can use the corn as trellis to climb upon and we will get harvest from both that is corn and cucumbers or beans, whatever we are planting. Next. So here we can see uh, these are sweet corn plants and uh, beans are grown, which will take support of the sweet corn and grow. In the second picture, we can see some uh, gods growing underneath the corn. Next. Component planting also helps in uh, improving the soil health. By planting uh, the plants with different root structures, we can aerate the soil and allow plants to pull nutrients from different parts of the soil profile. Uh, some plants which have uh, tap roots or uh, tuber crops like potatoes or 
Carrots can help to break the soil compaction. And deep rooted crops like melons and tomatoes pull water and nutrients from the deeper prof uh, deeper section of the soil profile. So also by adding legumes to the uh, crop plant, we can uh, maximize the soil health because legumes helps in atmospheric uh, fixation of the nitrogen. And the nitrogen which is fixed by the legumes can be uh, useful for the subsequent crops. So legumes, some of the examples include peas and beans and cowpea and cluster beans are common which can be grown in Goa. Then legumes can be either be planted as a crop to harvest or can be sown as a legume cover crop underneath the main crop, like sowing cowpea under the sweet corn in a garden bed. Next. It also helps in pollination. Uh, as Simeon has uh, explained about the pollination in detail, we can uh, attract a large number of pollinators by growing different types uh, of flowers in the field at the periphery or in the uh, rows in between the main crop. For uh, example, esters in, uh, in the garden can help to attract uh, many uh, types of bees and other insects also. Next. So uh, pest management, this is one of the main motives of companion uh, farming. So companion plant works in three uh, ways to help manage pests. The uh, first one is with smells. So some plants have uh, ability to emit some odors that repel insects or some has order that attract them or simply mask the odor of other plants. Due to these traits, we can use plants to pull pests away from the other crops. So these are basically called as trap crops. For example, if we can see here in the picture, some marigolds are planted in between the chili field. So what uh, what marigolds will do here is they will, with the help of their order, they will attract the pest, which uh, which generally will attack on the chili. And we can uh, spray chemicals or we can uh, control this pest by spraying on the marigold instead of spraying on the chili field. So this will help in our uh, motive of controlling pest. Similarly, some crops help in repelling the pest. And uh, some insects are less likely to land on garden vegetables because there are too many uh, signals to interpret. Next. We can also control the pest population in the field by attracting predators or parasitoids. Some predators uh, eat other insects and uh, parasitoids are generally those which lay eggs on the insides of the other insects. So thereby they help in controlling the pest population. Then by providing habitat and food for these insects, uh, we can attract them to the garden, which can help to manage pests. Then there are also uh, visual distraction to the pest. Some insects are visual uh, use visual cues to find their target plants, such as leaves, shape or color. So when we are planting different uh, types of plants in the field, it becomes difficult for the pest to find a target crop. Next. So here we can see some plant families and uh, the beneficial insects which are attracted towards them. In the daisy family, we have uh, plants like asters, sunflowers and daisy. These are basically flowers. Uh, these uh, flowers will attract Parasitic wasp, hoverflies, green lace wing, ladybug beetles. All these insects are uh, predatory insects and they generally feed on aphids or uh, mealybugs and thereby help in uh, controlling them. The next one is mint family. In mint, we have uh, aromatic herbs like mint and basil. So this will also attract bees or ho hoverflies and other insects. The bees will generally help in pollination and hoverflies also might help in pollination and excess uh, predatory insects. Then carrot family, we have carrot, coriander and cumin which uh, can be grown here. And this will help in attracting ladybird beetles, overflies and parasitic wasps. Also spiders uh, also help in uh, pest control as they predate on the aphids and other uh, small insects. Then there are uh, other colorful flowers which can be used which will attract a large variety of beneficial insects and especially pollinators. Next. 
so here uh, in this picture we can see the first one is a uh, ladybird beetle then there is a b which is excess pollinator then green this being which is feeding on the small it feeds then down we have hoverfly and the last one is a uh, sorry uh, this this black color one is the parasitic wasp and the last one is a hoverfly so these are some beneficial insects which are uh, attracted towards flowering crops or the crops which we have discussed like mint, uh, mint and uh, carrot family. Next. So uh, we have already seen the companion planting in space. So uh, there is we can also do companion planting in time, uh, which is called as crop rotation. So most of the uh, vegetables uh, varieties such as cabbage, corn, tomatoes are heavy feeders and they require uh, nutrients in large quantity. Whereas there are some other uh, root crops like carrot, radishes or beets which are light feeders and they prefer low nitrogen levels. And they can thrive on uh, compost. There is no uh, need of some other uh, nutrients. Then there are some heavy givers uh, such as legumes which will fix the atmospheric nitrogen and will help subsequent crops to uh, provide the nitrogen to the crops. So to best utilize this, we can maintain soil fertility by making a proper crop rotation. So what we can do here is we can first plant light feeding root crops, which can be followed by heavy giving legumes. And finally, we can uh, grow the leafy uh, feeders on the crops. Such a crop rotation in time gives the soil a rest and chance to rejuvenate between nutrient depleting crops. So this is a component planting in time. Next. So here are some general examples of companion planting. In the picture, we can see uh, there is corn uh, growing and in between the corn uh, rows, we, we have grown some uh, gourds here down, which will uh, take help of uh, the corn as a trellis and grow. What it will do here is both the crops will give uh, yield without affecting each other and um, by mutually benefiting each other. So we can also mix flowers and herbs in the garden to attract beneficial insects and pollinators. Then uh, legumes, as we have already seen, helps in uh, fixing atmospheric nitrogen and it helps in uh, providing nitrogen readily to the uh, coming crop. Next. So here we will see uh, some crops one by one. Uh, for example, in Chile, uh, we can do companion planting with pumpkin, beans or onions. Uh, these crops go well with each other, but uh, we, we should avoid planting chili with potato or eggplant. Then tomato, we can plant basil and marigold. Marigold will act uh, as trap crops in the tomato crop. And uh, this is effective at reducing thrip propagation and intercropping with basil may even help in promoting the growth of tomato. Then in cucumbers and uh, melons, by providing habitat and consistent flower throughout the season, we can support the uh, bumblebees. This bees uh, helps in pollination in the garden, which will help uh, improve the pollination. Then in sweet corn, uh, as we have seen already uh, many examples, we can grow cluster beans or some melons. So uh, what this will do here is they will attract uh, many predators and also some pollinators in the field. Then uh, there is one fly, syrphid fly, the, the larva of which consumes on uh, aphids. Uh, this syrphid fly adults are attracted to a wide variety of flowers. So by simply uh, including plenty of flowers in the garden, we can attract adults, which will lay eggs uh, in the nearby and they will help in the control of aphids in the field. So that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you, Akshay. It was indeed a knowledgeable session and we got to know a lot about advantages of companion planting. Uh, Mr. Aaron Andrad uh, is back after solving his net uh, after solving his voice issues. Now let's resume back to listening to Mr. Aaron Andrad. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Your voice is echoing because there are two devices. Shut down your 
प्लांटिंग so the and the advantages are like the you can raise a vegetable year round bigger year round production of seedling and it is more convenient to look after your baby seedlings that is it, it is possible to provide favorable growing conditions like germination as well as for growth so even if the environment is not proper if it's raining or the, the temperature is low you can raise your nursery or grow your seedlings inside a uh, Instead of a shade net or a poly low tunnel, then you get a the shorter growing season and more efficient use of land. So instead of directly sowing the crops in the main field, if you start raising your nursery, so you uh, save time and space, and also it reduces the field management cost. Like uh, once you grow a vegetable directly in the field, then you have, you have to do weeding and all, and those uh, it will it cost quite a lot. So you reduce the uh, cost of weeding and other management aspects. Next, next slide, please. Uh, so these are the vegetables to uh, grow in the winter season. So what vegetables you can grow is that we have the uh, under cucumbers we have cucumber, watermelon, bitter gourd, pumpkin, watermelon, and ivy gourds. You know, um, mostly like watermelon and cucumber comes best during this time. Uh, like, In solanaceous crop, we have tomato, chili, and potato, brinjal, and capsicum. In greens and root, we have uh, carrot, radish, red amaranthus, spinach, lettuce, uh, cabbage, nolkur, and sweet potato. And uh, beans, a uh, vegetable, cowpea, French bean, yard long beans, and cluster beans. In bulb, we have onion and garlic, and okra and sweet corn, baby corn. And next slide, please. So these are the vegetables you can see. The bottle gourd, carrot, uh, tomato, common vegetable which are grown in the winter season. Yeah, right. Uh, next slide, please. So this is crop planning. So what is crop planning like? If you want to start your own uh, vegetable garden at home, so you can select like about eight to ten crops like you want to consume like in a particular month or a week, and You plan it backward. Like you have to determine first of all, find the duration of the crop. Like how long it, the crop takes uh, in order for you to get or consume it or harvest it, harvest the crop. So, like for example, radish and red amaranthus, they take about thirty to forty-five days to harvest from the uh, time of sowing. So you will have to plan like thirty to you have to grow the crop or sow the crop thirty to forty-five days before uh, before so you can harvest it on the uh, specific day or the month that you uh, plan to uh, consume it. And also gives you scope for intercropping. Like if you grow for if you are growing chili and uh, chili, which takes about six, which uh, is a duration of six months. In in between that, you can plant the radish as an intercrop because it takes about forty uh, five days to harvest. So by that time, the chili plant starts flowering. You can harvest the radish. Okay, next next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So second, we have the succession planting. The succession planting is a practice. Uh, uh, instead of grow, instead of sowing all the vegetable seeds uh, at once, uh, you can grow the seeds in a in a batches or batches of of uh, at an interval of seven to twenty one days. So you can have the vegetable at a uh, throughout the year. And there are like succession planting. We have two types of vegetable. Like one is the determinate crops. And there is an indeterminate uh, crop. So indeterminate crop is like the leafy vegetables, like lettuce, beans, peas, corn, carrot, radish. Which uh, once you grow them, you uh, you can harvest at a at a, at a particular time. Like at once you harvest them, harvest all the vegetables. While indeterminate uh, plants are like the tom indeterminate tomatoes, cucumbers, and melons. Like you get the harvest continuously. Like once you plant them, like for a month or two or three months, you get continuous harvest. So you don't have to replant them again. And you can increase the succession uh, time or the planting time 
uh, from about uh, once the yeah accordingly on next slide please so this is an example of a radish being success succession planted okay so this is like this is the first 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 batch then the second third and it, it follows like every week you can plant little or little so you can harvest like every week okay and next slide please so you can from this is a crop calendar or planting calendar you can uh, maintain this to uh, keep track of all your inter uh, interculture operation like weeding fertilizer application the uh, thing up and fertilizer spray pesticide etc so here we have the this calendar which is a fruit of hard work like you have the vegetable a specific vegetable so you can write the variety and the date of sowing and date of transplanting when you want to transplant and then the manuring at what time like you can put specific dates for like every 15 days if you want to man, uh, trying to manure the crop then you can uh, write the dates down in a plan plan ahead and also the pesticide schedule you, uh, which you plan to do um, and harvesting time you can write so accordingly you can like it's easy to manage everything in one place only with this calendar uh, and next slide please so this is seed treatment so so we, we normally see two types of seeds in the market if you go like you see see these colored seeds which are hybrid seeds normally with the companies provide with other other local seed which are not red seed which are the, the in a natural color so like and why we do seed treatment is to get better germination and to prevent uh, seed from uh, seed and soil borne disease we do seed treatment so we have two types of seed treatment Uh, which uh, we can practice is the seed dressing so seed dressing is like the seed is uh, treated with a dry formulation or a wet or wet treated treated with a slurry or a liquid formulation which is of a bio um, bio fungi uh, fungicide or bactericide which is like trichoderma species and pseudomonas fluorescens uh, which is used actually 10 grams per 100 gram of seed and the other is a seed coating is a method which is followed by the industry the seed companies uh, they follow mm-hmm. next slide please so this is a uh, coated seed with uh, with the different uh, pesticides and this is a uh, seed which treated with a trichoderma is a bio bio fungicide yeah. next slide yeah. uh, i mean di- and the, like that you can sowing is done in two ways direct sowing and transplanted sowing so like this is a direct sowing in this uh, method of sowing the seeds are directly planted or sown in the main field rather than by raising seedlings in the nursery so the, the crops like you do direct sowing is the bendy then radish amaranthus coriander fenugreek uh, cucurbits uh, cowpea and cluster beans all beans and uh, root uh, root and uh, green leafy vegetables and next slide please <laughs> Uh, so in winter you normally have to cover your beds because the temperature is normally low and uh, the growth is very slow so with this uh, covering the plastic uh, polythene covering like the temperature is increase and humidity is well maintained uh, okay so is a this is a raised bed technique where you plant the vegetables on the raised bed directly by making furrows in between and then uh, put a covering over the Okay, or make a low tunnel. The next slide. So the, these are the crops which are normally grown on the raised beds: are uh, radish, red amaranthus, spinach, coriander, nolcol, cabbage, and all the like soluble vegetables. The seedlings are raised on the raised bed. So direct direct seeding on the raised. So br- red amaranthus and uh, uh, radish can be either like broadcasted or they can be uh, line sown so for that like you have to make a uh, 75 cm wide beds are prepared with the uh, 30 cm high and 50 cm walking path they loosen the soil over the bed and mix vermi compost in it and then then you can either broadcast the seed directly or open some small furrows and with a stick and then place the seeds in the furrow gently and cover with the soil then water with a rose can every day or in the morning and evening till they get a proper growth and next slide please uh 
This is a line on uh, radish. And this is a uh, next slide. For raising cucumber nursery, nursery like uh, we normally do a pre uh, pre germinate. Uh, we normally do pre germination, germinate the seed or we are soaking the seeds. We uh, 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 for that we have to soak the seeds in the water for about eight hours and then drain the water and let the seeds um, sit for uh, another like twelve hours so that the the seeds start germinating. And this increases the time taken um, for germination. Other if you plant direct, the germination is not uniform. So by uh, uh, pre germinating the seed, like you get a uniform germination by soaking the seeds. Okay. And direct sowing uh, can do by making a shallow basin. After sowing, uh, germinating the seeds, we make a shallow basin in the soil and sow three seeds spaced at 15 cm apart in a triangle. And the best time for growing the cucurbits is August and September. Um, and sowing in pro trees or polybags. Uh, for advanced harvesting of the cucurbits by about one month, seedlings can be raised under covered conditions during December for winter season and transplanted at normal sowing time of the cucurbit. So you, by raising the nursery or by growing the cucurbits in, in the polythene bed for one month, you save, uh, like you save, you get an early crop and you save the time taken for their growth. Next slide, please. The soaking seeds like before sowing them and this is a nursery transplanting the seeds after they are uh, raised for our 15 to 15 days or 30 days and next slide the okra and sweet corn direct sowing using a ridge and furrow method so you have to make uh, make ridges and furrows and sow the seeds on the side of the ridges uh, so two seeds at every 30 centimeter one feet in a row and 45 centimeter apart the direction in this okra. Ne next slide. The second, we have the transplanted crops. Normally, these include the tomatoes, brinjal, chilies, cabbage, cauliflower, nolkol, and uh, curry leaves. In this method of planting, the initial vegetable seeds are sown in the nursery, uh, raised nursery beds, or in the pro trees to produce healthy seedlings. After required growth of the seedling is obtained, usually 25 30 days, the seedlings are removed and replanted in the main field at required spacing. And the other vegetables, uh, vegetable raised by cuttings, like the ivy gourd and sweet potato, we just take the cuttings of these vegetables and directly plant them. Uh, next slide, please. So, nursery raising uh, using the pro trays. So you know, take a pro trays. Uh, okay, pro trays are nothing but uh, seedling trays made of plastic cups of different sizes. Okay, then mix sterilized cocoa peat about 30 kg with half kg of neem cake along with azospirillum and phosphobacteria each uh, of 100 grams. Uh, approximately 1.2 kg of cocoa peat is required to fill one pro tray of 98 cells. So the treated seeds in the pro tray at uh, one seed per cell. We cover the seeds with the cocoa peat and keep the trays one above the other and cover with the polythene sheet till germination starts. After six days, uh, place the pro trays with germ germinated seeds individually on the raised bed inside the shade net. Uh, water with a rose can every day and drench with uh, 19 and 19 NPK fertilizer of 0.5 or 5 grams per liter of water at 18 days after sowing. And then you can also use uh, panchagavya also for this. Like ten pro were uh, okay. They are arranged. Ten pro are arranged one over the other, and they are covered with a polythene sheet uh, to maintain the temperature and darkness inside the uh, trays. Now on the fifth day, the polythene cover uh, is taken out and water is sprinkled by a rose can. After the seedlings are uh, maintained in the shade net, begin hardening, transplanting one to two weeks. Uh, one to two weeks pri prior to setting out the plants you know, in your garden by exposing transplant seedlings gradually to outdoor conditions. Yeah, after this, you have to place the seedlings in the shade net, a 50% shade net, uh, so that they uh, get hardened and they get acclimatized to the environment, outside environment, or to the climate. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, this is a filling of the protrace with cocoa peat. 
and then uh, seeding the putting one seed per cell in the protrace and this is the germinated uh, trace and next slide next slide please this is a protective structure used for nursery raising which is in winter this is a, this is a low tunnel the picture on the uh, left is a low tunnel structure which is used and yeah and these both structures like they uh, they maintain the temperature inside and humidity and the plant growth is uh, maintained at optimum level uh, so they prevent any insect pest damage to the nursery the next slide so raising nursery of solanaceous crop uh, tomato solanaceous crop of tomato chili and brinjal let seeds are sown in the nursery bed or protrace and transported to the main field after 7 to 8 weeks during the winter over and is 8 to 10 cm tall yeah and they have 4 to 5 leaves to it and next slide please uh ivy got a super to growing using cutting like you have to take like a three uh, ivy got cutting of uh, two to three nodes and plant them in a container or uh, poly bags and uh, top shoot cutting of the uh, super to plants and next slide and the nursery pest management the major pest will affect the nursery are the, uh, the sucking pest or the white flies aphid mealybugs thrips mites and beetles Okay, and you and to monitor this pest, like we normally use a yellow color or and blue color sticky traps, so we know that, that the pest is present in the in the nursery area. And then if the, if the pest is present, then we use five uh, ml of neem oil extract and two ml of liquid soap in one liter of water and spray this solution. And also, you can use like mix five to ten uh, gram of microbial pesticide like Bure, Bacena, Verticillium lecani in one liter of water and spray. Next slide, please. This is a Bure. Uh, this is a Baba. This is a Bure Basiana. And two, and the neem cake. And these are a uh, yellow and blue sticky traps. Next slide. So nursery diseases are mo uh, the uh, two major or two important diseases are the bacterial wilt and the damping off. Uh, for 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 their control, like we use Pseudomonas fluorescens and Trichoderma. Uh, treat the seeds with the uh, before plant before sowing the seeds. So normally, I would treat the seeds with the uh, uh, with the Pseudomonas fluorescens or the Trichoderma uh, at 10 grams per 100 gram 10 gram per 100 gram of seed. In soil application of Trichoderma and Pseudomonas fluorescens is a 50 grams mixed with one kg of soil and incorporated in the nursery bed. Pseudomonas seed, uh, seedling deep at 10 ml per liter of water for half an hour in the shade before transplanting. This prevent the wilting of the uh, nursery plants in sudden death. Next slide, please. And these are the products uh, which have these bio agents like the bio POF, bio and the nisar. Next slide. The damping of disease in uh, nursery. And next slide. Mm. And the bacteria with the symptoms like the plant uh, normally dies at a fruiting stage or the flowering stage. Okay. So what we have learned is the winter vegetables, uh, what vegetables we can grow in the winter, then um, crop planning, uh, what we have to uh, crop planning, then succession planting, and maintaining our crop calendar, seed treatment, and raising beds and fruit trees, nursery, and management of nursery pests and diseases. Okay, next slide. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Aaron, for such a nice presentation. Dear all, the session is now open for questions. You may type your queries in the chat box or put on your microphones to ask. We love to hear from you.
Uh, I would repeat, uh, the session is now open for questions. Uh, you may type your queries in the chat box or put on your microphones to ask. Shutakshi, I think then wind up since there are no questions. Okay. okay. So now we have come to the end of the webinar. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Sir Miguel Braganza for joining with us today as session moderator. Special thanks to today's speakers, Ms. Simeon Fernandez, Mr. Aaron Andras, and Mr. Akshay Parab to make this session interesting and knowledgeable. I'm also thankful to the Botanical Society of Goa for conducting such agricultural webinars and also giving me this opportunity to anchor the session. We are grateful to the entire August gathering present today in the session to make the webinar lively. Thank you all and have a wonderful evening.